St. Thomas's spirit echoes across campus on game nights. Good evening, basketball fans, and welcome to Stanford's Court. Let's go, Michael. The faithful reconnect. Nice to see you. Jim Deutsch greets Gabby and Anna Ware, basketball fans through family. Their grandfather, Doug Hennis, and I have been very good friends for a lot of years, and he's been bringing the girls to the games from the beginning. It's just weird, like, coming here without, like, without him being here. Doug Hennis sat in these seats. Typically over there. But this spirit of St. Thomas is noticeably missing, leaving us too soon last summer. The whole reason we're even having this conversation is because of the things Doug has done here at St. Thomas. Every time we play, I get somebody that stops by and says, you know, it's just very different without Doug around. Steve Fritz, as an admissions counselor, first met the kid from Owatonna in the early 70s. His nickname in high school was Doc, and I gotta presume it would, a lot of it was because he knew a little bit about everything. Hennis's journey of doing everything began as a writer and editor at the Aquan, which from St. Thomas led to a 14-year stint with the Pioneer Press. He was a, first a reporter and well-respected, but then he really made his name as the Metro editor. And Hennis's name got bigger with his hand in two Pulitzers. He was interested in, in helping people get the best stories and writing them in the best way possible. But that St. Thomas spirit drew Hennis home in 1990 to a dream job, starting as executive director of university relations. He did things that were well outside of what he needed to do, and they were all to make St. Thomas better. Hennis's behind-the-scenes fingerprints are everywhere. Perhaps no one can count the programs he touched. For instance, 360 Journalism. I'm a little embarrassed to say I know he was working all these back channels. He didn't feel like I needed to know that. I just knew he was out there doing it. The Fry Science and Engineering Center exists because Hennis secured $15 million from the federal government. I worked for Senator Wellstone for a couple years after I left journalism and, and who should show up in our office lobbying on behalf of a building at the University of St. Thomas but Doug Hennis. He'd go after a project like a terrier with a bone. Hennis also joined Father Dennis Deese on his travels to Cuba and Uganda, about writing about both. He was also part oh, of the president's staff. St. Thomas uh, would be less than it is today if Doug Hennis had not come along. Certainly not the campus as it is today. Doug was the face of St. Thomas in the neighborhood. In the end, his patience and uh, unflappability made it possible for St. Thomas to expand to meet its needs. Telling the story of what St. Thomas has become falls to university writers like Jordan Osterman, who learned from the master. He was very willing at times to, to talk about his, his previous career, but not in any kind of way that made you feel like you were short because you didn't have 17 years of Pulitzer Prize winning experience at the Pioneer Press. <laughs> Hennis's countless writings, from sports to the St. Thomas Magazine, are a legacy of his spirit. He was, in my mind, and the embodiment of what a Tommy is. He was it. Yes, that spirit of St. Thomas to which Anna and Gabby had a front row seat. Asking him for money for the concession stand. He'd get really mad because he said, it's not about the candy, it's about the game. And now it's about Hennis as recipient of the Monsignor James Lavin Award. It was actually Doug's idea. The Monsignor James Lavin Award really is meant to represent someone who uh, does service to the Alumni Association and, and to the university. Who could be more deserving? He was so special, man of oh man, I'll tell you. His blood was purple, not red. It was all so wrapped together, you didn't really get a sense of where Doug ended and St. Thomas began. Commitment, such commitment. But he was a cigar buddy to me. 